So here we are at Pebble Mill in Birmingham for the fifth and final round of Young Scientist of the Year 1980. We have the four heat winners with us in the studio and in the next 40 minutes we're going to select just one of them to receive this trophy presented by the Royal Institution of Great Britain. Now we have the director of that august body, Professor Sir George Porter. He's one of our four judges again this year and we're delighted to have his great experience not only of science but also of this programme. With him are Dr Mary Archer, a lecturer in chemistry at Cambridge University, Professor David Nichols, a biologist from Exeter University, and Colin Blakemore, Professor of Physiology at Oxford, who has been with us throughout the series to provide some consistency in the level of scoring from one round to the next. The finalists are our winners from last week from Tynemouth with their work on the more efficient purification of water using enzymes. The team from Wrexham, who have been working with bumblebees, the Newcastle group with their ideas on lighting for the theatre and the girls from Bex Hill who've been investigating absent-mindedness. Let's begin with them by rerunning part of the film of their work in progress. It began, you may remember, with an investigation among their friends which came up with some interesting and in some cases rather amusing instances of this sort of behaviour. So they decided to extend their survey to the entire school. Come in. The problem with our investigation is that we couldn't actually take students into the classroom and tell them to do something absent-minded. We had to depend on self-report books, which we made up. Check that you've been filling your booklets in uh, correctly. It continued for four weeks altogether. Each form was assigned to a sixth former who had two forms altogether. They went along and explained it to them in detail. And they returned to the form a couple of times a week to find out how they're getting on. But if you can't decide which is which, just write them down. And when we collect the booklets in, we'll have a look and say whether it's forgetting or absent-mindedness. We made up this um, little leaflet on the front with instructions, as simple as possible, asking time, place, about the absent-minded event, where it occurred, how they were feeling physically, they felt unwell, tired, and how their mood was, if they were happy, depressed, etc. And um, their academic qualifications, wondering if people who appeared to be more intelligent um, did more absent-minded activities than people who weren't so, so intelligent. October 2, 14th. When the booklets had been collected, the data that we obtained was fed into the computer, which had been programmed to give us a frequency distribution. When this was plotted, it showed distinct peaks of time during the day when there were more absent-minded occurrences than at other times. These were especially first thing in the morning between 7 and 8, at lunchtime and in the evening between 4 and 5. The reason for this we think could be that at these times there is more action and it's a change in routine than at any other time in the day as people are travelling to and from work. Lunchtime is a complete change in routine. People are out of the situation they've been in all morning and are used to being in and may go somewhere different for lunch or meet different people to what they're used to meeting during the rest of the day. So they could therefore be concentrating on more things than just one. <laughs> We looked through our booklets and to find out the number of occurrences that people did and some people were very much more absent-minded than others, although both groups of people have kept their booklets up to date. So we're planning to get them to do two tasks to see if it ties up with the absent-mindedness, doing two tasks at once. And the two tasks that we're going to do is um, combining mirror drawing with counting backwards from a long, large number. Six hundred. And 59. You set up a mirror with a piece of paper and a star and you get the person to draw it around the star looking only in the mirror and the image is back to front and upside down and also you get them to count back in threes from a large number at the same time and to see if the person who is very absent-minded finds it more difficult than the person who is not absent-minded at all. 39, 38, 600 35, 632. Six Yesterday, when they arrived at Pebble Mill to set up their display for the judges, I asked the Bexhill team how their work had progressed since that film account was made before Christmas. 
but we decided to tidy up our statistics. And by making each event independent, we found that we still had a very significant uh, peaks and troughs of when absent-mindedness occurred. And we also did a digit span, which proved that um, numbers had nothing to do with uh, the combined tasks. Now, the judges suggested that uh, your work might have some application to cutting down accidents. Have you just had a look at that since we saw you last? Well, we did contact the emergency services to find out when accidents did happen. And the peak periods did seem to coincide with ours. But of course, we'll have to go into this further to find out whether these were caused by absent-mindedness or just through... Other circumstances. Yeah. <laughs> now, here they are, ready to face the judges again. Fiona Wakeford... Kim Clements, Jackie Viner and Jackie Way from Bexhill College in Sussex. Colin Blakemore puts the first question. Kim, you obviously had a lot of fun doing this, uh, this project and you came across quite a few amusing reports. Would you like to give us one example that will bring out what you mean by absent-mindedness? Oh, well, I think the best example I can think of was a girl who, while coming to school, had a letter to post and she also had some receipts in the other hand. And instead of posting the letter, she posted the receipts. And that wasn't just a matter of, of forgetting? No, if she had forgotten, she'd have walked straight past the post box without putting anything in. Yes. Good, thank you. Jackie Viner, why did you choose a sensory motor and an arithmetical test? There are a number of psychological tests. Why did you choose those particular two? Well, we decided that it was definitely something to do with trying to do two things at once. Um, we had... We couldn't really test two things that were going on inside you at the same time. Um, and we decided that it was best to try and use something that we could be thinking about and watching at the same time. Um, but is that the sort of situation idea? in which people do have more absent-minded events, in which they're doing something in their mind and doing something with their hands at well, the same time? Looking through the booklets that we had back, we found that most of the time people were thinking of other things. Um, they weren't necessarily trying to do two things, but mm. we're always thinking about things. Suggests mm. you shouldn't listen to the radio while you're driving, doesn't it? Which mm. is rather bad news. Mm. Well, you're, you could be daydreaming, you could <coughs> be doing anything. Uh, it's very hard to control what a person thinks, wh whatever experiment we did. Yes. Mm. Uh, Jackie Way, one of the ways in which you kept up interest in the project among the school was to tell them at intervals how it was going. Yes. Do you think this had dangers in, in perhaps um, inviting the comments that they, ex they thought you might want, er errors of anticipation? Um, I don't think so really, because we didn't exactly tell them that the peaks occurred at this time, this time and this time, and so that they could make up all their absent-minded things to fit in with our routine. You don't think they made up any at all? Um, we had to go and visit the forms, each of us, and we got a very personal relationship with the whole of the form, so you can really tell if somebody's mm. likely to fabricate the There's so animals. many variables, aren't mm. there, Jackie yes, Viner? Sir. I mean, I would be interested to know how it affects age. Well, what well, about, is, is, is there any truth in the absent-minded <laughs> professor story? Well, unfortunately, we were unable to test any members of the public. Um, we wanted a, um, some subjects that we could um, keep an eye on and collect, collect the data easily. Um, we did ask the members of staff to <laughs> fill in booklets as well, but unfortunately they weren't very cooperative. You got a poor response. Yeah. yeah. Very poor. <laughs> <laughs> so we haven't really got a very good age difference. Oh dear. Jackie, Jackie Way, can I ask you what you see as the most significant finding to come out of your study? Well, I think our most significant finding is that we've actually found something that can show the difference between absent-minded and non-absent-minded people um, with the combined task you can tell whether they're absent-minded or non-absent-minded by their ability to complete this task. And nobody else seems to have been able to correlate anything to whether you're absent-minded or not. I think that's probably right. Thanks very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. We think of water as being always at hand, virtually on tap, but like most things, it has to be paid for. Our next team from Tynemouth have been looking at ways of making it cleaner and cheaper. This is a conventional way sewage is treated. It involves turbines putting oxygen into the water so that it allows the bacteria to breathe, which breaks down the impurities in the sewage. We are working on a chemical process which we hope will do the same thing but cheaper. We based our project on a chemical ha called hydrogen peroxide, which is also known as a hair bleach. This has two very important properties. 
One is that it's a disinfectant. The other is that it breaks down completely into pure oxygen and water. This reaction can be speeded up by using a catalyst called catalase, which can be, believe it or not, extracted from, among other things, ox liver. Just look what happens if I put a bit of liver into hydrogen peroxide. Unfortunately, the catalyst is only active for 15 minutes, which makes this reaction wasteful and expensive. However, the boys have been studying the properties of these resins. They are plastic beads which have been treated with acid and are well known for their glue-like chemical properties. Could the boys induce the complex catalyst molecules to stick onto the resins? And if so, would the catalyst remain active longer? If you take some resin here, place it in here, add some catalyst solution. Shake it up and add some hydrogen peroxide to it. You can see the resin is right onto the surface. This is because the oxygen produced from the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide is on the resin. The proven catalyst has in fact attached itself to the resin, thus prolonging the life of the catalyst. But how efficient was this novel treatment of the catalyst? The group set up this apparatus to measure the oxygen production rate from their new process and were able to deduce that the catalyst's working life had been extended from 15 minutes to three months. One of the most exciting applications of our discovery is in the purification of water. Here we have a special combination of resins, including our resin with catalyst on. And up here we have some impure water with hydrogen peroxide added. This water passes down and up through this column and the water you get out, it's very pure. Pure enough even to drink. Tastes fine. In the operating theatre, special water is essential. During the operation, the surgeon needs to wash his hands and the instruments need to be rinsed. This water costs 90 p a litre and this hospital uses 16,000 litres of this a year. We hope to produce it considerably more cheaply using a method we have developed. Since we made that film with you, you seem to have developed some new processes. Yes, we've developed this piece of equipment which measures the efficiency of the enzyme and have found it to be much more efficient than we previously thought. This piece of apparatus enables us to regenerate the column, so the column can be used over and over again. This makes our process more industrially viable. And cheaper? How does that affect your costs in producing pure water? Well, this water costs 90p a litre. It's an ordinary water. And we think we can produce it for less than 14p a litre. And pure enough for use in hospitals? Uh, yes, our water is more sterile than this needs to be.